But today we're in chapter 12, 2 Samuel. I'm going to read just the first portion of verse 1 and uh, remind you of a few things to contextualize this, and then we'll move into the chapter. We're not doing the entire chapter. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 25. So here in 2 Samuel, chapter 12, verse 1, first portion, it simply says, Then the Lord sent Nathan to David. Now we know that David, King David, has committed great sin against God and man. We know that David has had an adulterous relationship with a woman by the name of Bathsheba who was extremely beautiful. David had been walking on, the, uh, on his house in the front uh, porch, if you will, or back porch, and he had looked down and had seen this beautiful woman bathing. Lust was conceived in his heart. He brought her, he had her brought to him, and uh, they had an adulterous relationship, and she conceived, gave word to him, I am with child. We know the story how that David brought in uh, Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, who was one of his mighty men, extremely loyal to him, and tried to uh, get Uriah to go and spend time with his wife so that he would think the child that was conceived was his own. Uriah was a man of honor, a man of integrity, and uh, a man who was in love with God, knowing that the law of God would not allow him to have a relationship with his wife and rejoin the troops. He chose not to do so. Ultimately, David sends him out under orders, and uh, he gets killed in the line of duty. Word returns to David that Uriah is dead. David allows... Uh, Uriah's wife Bathsheba, customary time of mourning. He takes her to be his wife and uh, feels that he's covering up his actions. But the fact is, you can't do that. You see, this is typical of people. Sin is committed, a cover-up occurs, time passes by. God doesn't do anything immediately. People think that he's overlooked it, may even begin to think that they've gotten away with it. But in reality, what is happening is the Lord is giving them a season for them to actually experience what it is to be in disfavor with God and what it is to be under intense conviction. And sometimes it takes time for us to experience that to the degree that uh, puts us in a place where God can actually remedy it and chasten us. In the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, in chapter 8, verse 5, we read, You should know in your heart that as a man chastens his son, so the Lord your God chastens you. God loves you so much, he doesn't allow you to commit sin and get away with it. He actually chastens you. And according to Hebrews 12, 11, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. And so God loves us so much, he doesn't allow us to get away with sin, and he does chasten us, and ultimately it produces fruit in our life. Now, when somebody is in unrepentant sin, there are normally certain things that they begin to experience, and one of the things that slowly disappears from their life is the joy of God, the joy of the Lord, the joy of his presence. You know what it was like, I hope, that when you got saved, how that, that grief and that sorrow and that despair that perhaps you lived with was now removed and you have joy, something you hadn't had before. You now have relief and comfort and peace. I mean, that comes when you get right with God. Prior to being right with the Lord, you have a life that is basically, well, it's miserable. It's devoid of the joy that you really desire. And so what happens is, is you've committed your heart to Christ and, and that great, that great, burden that you at one time carried, it begins to roll off of you, and, and you're surprised by the, the joy that you have, that, that sense of, of God's presence that blesses your life, and, and that's an extraordinary thing. But you may go back into sin, and when you go back into the life of sin, that joy begins to disappear, and it's replaced by grief. That relationship that you wanted so much, that you knew the Lord wasn't in, you wanted it so badly you're willing to have, do anything to have it. Or, or that material object, that thing that you wanted so badly to buy, to drive, to wear, whatever. 
You were willing to do almost anything to get it, even steal if you had to, and, and you finally possessed that, or, or that job advancement that you were willing to compromise for in order that you might get that, that corner office, in order that you might get those perks and all. Well, you did what you needed to do to get those things to secure your position or to, to receive those material objects or to obtain that relationship, but it was all sinful, and, and, and now you're in such great sin, there's no joy in your life anymore. There's no sense of the presence of God. There's no peace anymore. Well, that's what took place in the life of David. When David went through this period of time, he got this most beautiful woman. She's pregnant. They're going to have a child together. A time that a lot of people will actually be rejoicing in. He's married her. Everything should be okay, shouldn't it? Well, during that time, uh, David would say to you, no, it was not okay. As a matter of fact, David wrote concerning this in the Psalms. When you read your Psalms, Psalm 32 and Psalm 51 speak concerning what David went through during this period in his life, during this season in his life. And, and I'm going to quote from those Psalms in a, in a little while. But, but what is taking place is David has committed adultery. David is spending time now in a sense of, of experiencing certain levels of grief and and uh, it's during this time that, according to verse 1, the Lord sent this prophet, a man by the name of Nathan, to David. So Nathan comes, and he's about to speak to David, and he's about to share with him some things that David needs to hear. It's time for David to realize that his sin did not escape God's attention. The psalmist in Psalm 90, verse 8 said, You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins, in the light of your countenance. Our secret sins. You know, we can come to church and we're all washed and combed and, you know, we have the holy smile and, and all of that when we come in. And people can look at us and can say, man, that is one sanctified person there. That person really has a walk with God. Uh, but they don't know the secret sins of our lives. They don't know the things that we do uh, in between when we're here in church and, uh, and when we're on our own. We have the secret sins. Now, now some sins of man go before them. I mean, they're obvious. Uh, when you're out in the street or you, you, you know some people who are into the drugs or into the immorality or into the alcohol. And, and I, you see the guy, you know he's a druggie. You see the guy, you know he's an alcoholic. I mean, you see it, it's all over them, you know. Some men's sins go before them, they're obvious, but others follow behind. That means that they're not so obvious. And so some people can look so good, some people can look so righteous, some people can, can act so righteous. They've got a scripture for every occasion. I mean, you know, they're the bless the Lord, praise God type, you know. But in reality, there's something going on inside of them that needs to be exposed. And that's why the psalmist said that he wanted God to reveal his secret sins. And God is aware of those things. And this is what's about to take place. God is going to expose that in the life of David. Now David has been going through grief. But it's now time for this to be dealt with. And so what happens? Well, here comes Nathan. And, and Nathan approaches David and actually gives to him uh, what is really a, a parable. But is, is presented to David as, as if it's an actual event that occurred. And you need to understand that. It's really a parable, but the way Nathan presents it, David actually thinks that as the king, Nathan the prophet is bringing to him a case that he needs to adjudicate. And so what's taking place here is David is going to be taken by this parable and his life is about to be exposed. So here it goes in verse 1. He came to him and said to him, There were two men in one city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb which he had bought and nourished. And it grew up together with him and with his children. It ate, at his own, it ate of his own food and drank from his own cup and lay in his bosom. It was like a daughter to him. And a traveler came to the rich man who refused to take from his own flock and from his own herd to prepare one for the wayfaring man who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. And so he gives to him this story. Remember with me that this is applicable to David because David is a shepherd. 
So David knows what it's like to have an attachment to certain little lambs and all that he would care for, you know, because not all animals are the same, and you can see one, and you can even develop a, an affection for it, and, and, and we need to understand that, that, that the lambs and all the sheep in, in the Middle Eastern custom during the time of David uh, many times were looked at as, as household pets, the way that you might love your dog or your cat or whatever animal that you think have special affection for. Well, in the case of, of uh, David, he would have had certain lambs that he thought were like, like pets to him, and, and therefore he had an affection for them. And so when Nathan comes and gives to him this particular parable, David, thinking that it's a real event, listens intently, and it's the right kind of thing to say to David because it's something David has a fondness for. It's like if you walk up to a man who, who loves to build, a, you know, cars and all, and you begin to share about some guy who had a cool car, and, and uh, he put all of his time and his livelihood into it, and then, then, then somebody came and ripped him off. Well, that would get the guy really upset, and he'd say, that guy, well, look at how David responds as he hears this. David's anger, verse 5, was, was greatly aroused against the man, and he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this shall surely die, and he shall restore fourfold for the lamb because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Now, when David says he, shall, he should die, uh, he shall surely die, he's not speaking in terms of a king saying he's going to now bring capital punishment against this guy for killing a lamb. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is what a lot of guys would say. They'd say that guy's a jerk, he ought to get shot. And that's basically what David is saying here. He's not saying as a king we're going to have him put to death. What he's saying is that guy ought to be shot. That what he's done was wrong. He ought to be dealt with. But he also says, and this is what's interesting, because he thinks that he's, he's uh, making a judgment, he shall restore, verse 6, he sh shall restore fourfold for the lamb because he did this thing and because he had no pity. So David, as the king, is giving a pronouncement. He's giving a judgment that comes right out of Scripture. Exodus chapter 22, verse 1 says that if somebody takes a person's lamb, they replace it with four. And so what David is doing here is he's saying, listen, he's saying if this man did that, then he has to replace it with four of his own. But what has happened is David has gotten caught. David doesn't understand that this is just a story intended to grab him, to, to take his heart and to, to, to make it apparent that something has to be done because of what he has done. So notice what happens in verse 7. Nathan said to David, you are the man. You are the man. Now he's not saying you're the man. He's saying you are the man. What you've done is, is, is so wrong that God has given to me a message to you to speak to you, but you need to know that what you have done is as evil as this rich man who stole this poor man's lamb. David, you're the man. You're the man in this story. You're the man who needs to be dealt with. You're the man in sin. Now this took a lot of courage, by the way, for Nathan to walk up to the king of Israel, a man that was so absolutely incredible that the whole nation loved him, I mean, if King David were alive today and would walk into this congregation, it wouldn't take any time for the men in this congregation to say, now that guy is a man's man. He's a leader and, and, and have an admiration for him. It would take no time for the women in this church to see King David walk in and say, now that guy's a hunk. He is handsome. Because that was David. David had charisma. He had personality. He had that, that thing about him, that kingly disposition. So, so he was the kind of person that people would naturally gravitate to. People would say, you know what, you're the kind of guy that I can follow into battle. You're the kind of person I can trust. That was David. David had this intimidating factor about him. Not only was he a powerful man, everybody knew that he, he slew Goliath, a, a giant that was four feet bigger than he. Everybody knew what kind of man this was. Everybody knew he was a warrior. He was a warrior's warrior. And not only that, but the men around him were champions themselves. And he was the best of them all. Everybody knew that about David. And he was a king. And God delighted in him. And yet you have this man, a man by the name of Nathan, approaching him, telling him a story, and then you almost can see his finger pointing into the chest of David. And he says to him, you're the man. Now that took courage, that took boldness, that took a fear of God, that took a willingness to take whatever came from David after he said that, this is a man of God, Nathan. And Nathan was willing to stand up with courageous uh, vigor and say to this man, you're the one who did it. 
You're the one who's been, are being judged right now. This story's really about you. Now, there are some people who would say, when they're in sin, they would say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm heartbroken over this. I'm going through some bad times this season. God, what happened? And there are others who would say, I do only what is natural for me, and I don't really care about you, your God, or your Bible. It doesn't matter at all. I mean, it's a bunch of superstitious uh, uh, gobbledygook. It's all fairy tales. It's all just stories, myths. I, I don't really care. And, and those, who, those who would say, I don't really care, are spoken of by Jesus himself in John chapter 3. Because in the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 19 through 21, Jesus said, This is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world. Men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they've been done in God. Those people who like to sin and enjoy their sin, they stay in the darkness because they love the darkness. When I was a young person, before I came to Christ, and I would go to a party... You know, and the guys would pick up on a girl. They'd go into one of the bedrooms. The lights were always turned off. They didn't want the lights on. They didn't want people seeing what they were doing in the dark. That's how it works. That's what sin is all about. Do it in the dark, but we don't want the light to be shown on, on what we're doing. That's how people are. They enjoy the dark. They want to live in the dark. They, they play in the dark. They sin in the dark. But those who walk in the light are willing to have their deeds exposed so that all will see that they're done for the Lord. Well, David is one of those men who had grief in his heart for what he has done. And so when, when Nathan comes with this message and says, you're the man, he's letting David know that, that this story is about you, David, and, and David is ready to hear it. You see, sometimes, especially when somebody starts into a new sin, they don't want to hear it. I can't tell you how many people, even in this fellowship, who, you know, come to Bible study, even serve the Lord. They're single Sometimes they've been married. And they meet somebody on the job. And before you know it, they get involved. It takes some time, but they work hard at it, and they finally get into it. And now they're into sin. One of their friends might say something to them. What happened to you, man? You used to be an usher here. I hardly ever see you. What happened to you when they run across them at the store or someplace? I haven't seen you in church in a long time, man. What's up? Nothing. Doing good. Hey, we used to talk about the Lord together. Look, I don't want to be, you know, pressing you too much. Maybe it's a sensitive area, but I miss you. What's going on with you? Well, the guy's in sin. She's in sin. Doesn't want to be around people of the Lord. Sometimes they bounce from church to church. They hide out until they're found out. Then they go to another church. Place to place, place to place. But they're miserable. Because they're convicted. And anytime something is said that bothers them, they just up and leave. They go someplace else because this church doesn't love me. No, we hate the sin. And, and you should too. Because it grieves God. And because your life is miserable. And that's what was going on with David. But you know, it took a while for David to be in the place where the Lord could actually deal with him. Because the child is born. And everybody knows gestation is nine months. And so there's a time where she conceives... There was probably about a 30-day mourning period that she mourned the loss of her husband. Then she gives birth to the baby. You're looking at no less than nine months in the life of David. Some commentators believe that it's closer to about a year that he went through this time where he's in sin, trying to hide it, but not dealing well with it, and under conviction. He writes about it, Psalm 32, verses 3 and 4. David says, When I kept silent... My bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. I was dying inside. I was drying up inside. My life was going nowhere. It felt like I was in a desert spiritually. And so Nathan gives God's message to David. But he does so in the form of a parable. And as he shares with them, David is caught by this parable. He's caught, and that's why he says, you are the man. You are the one who did this. Again, Nathan speaks boldly, courageously. He takes his life into his hands, but he tells him the truth. He delivers a message, a message that has been entrusted to him. By the way, by way of application, even to this day, 
we too have been entrusted with a message that needs to be courageously proclaimed. When Paul was writing in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, the apostle said, as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. Because a person that you have to answer to is God himself. And when God gives to you his word, he's actually trusting you with it. So a pastor who stands up in a pulpit like this and just basically is always giving sweet sermons, little what we call sermonettes. Well, we need to remember that a sermonette will produce a Christianette. A little teeny sweet sermon doesn't really do anything in the life of a person. And when God says, this is what needs to be said, the minister of the gospel ought to have the courage and boldness to say what God says. And that's what Nathan did. Nathan said, this is the Lord. This is from God, David, and you're the man. You're the one who did it, David, and God is dealing with you. Now, David is in that position to be able to receive because he's been drying up inside. And so courageously, he gives him this message. Now notice, when he says in verse 7, You are the man, thus says the Lord God of Israel. I anointed you king over Israel. I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your keeping and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I also would have given you much more. I gave you everything that you have. You at one time were, were a shepherd just watching the sheep. I gave you the victory over Goliath. I gave you the hearts of the men of Israel. I gave to you the kingdom. I gave to you the, the responsibility over Saul's house and, and his wives and concubines. I gave you all authority, David. I'm the one who did this in your life. I anointed you. I delivered you. I gave you your master's house. I gave you your master's wives. I gave you the entire nation. I gave you everything. And if you were lacking anything, Dave, I would have given you much more. I gave you it all. That's a powerful statement, by the way. If you were lacking anything, I'd have given you much more. All you needed to do was ask. Dave, you have several wives now. You have concubines. And you have many sons. You have a beautiful palace that you live in. You have it all. When you've gone out into the battlefield, you've had nothing but victory. Victory after victory after victory. And if you were ever lacking even a little bit, I'd have given you even more. So he says to him in verse 9, Why have you despised the commandments of the Lord to do evil in his sight? You've killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. You have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon. You have had everything you needed, including access to any woman who could legitimate, legitimately be available to you. But instead of being blessed by this, you stole another man's wife and had the husband killed. Now, even though the Ammonites killed Uriah, David is held responsible for his death. And what he's saying is, you violated my law. You committed murder and you committed adultery. You broke the sixth and the seventh commandment. And you gave the Ammonites the ability to triumph when they killed the Jewish soldiers in Uriah. Now keep in mind when a believer lives an ungodly life, the enemies of the cross rejoice. It harms the cause of Christ when Christians fall and unbelievers have a field day with that. And when it's a national figure, the press has a field day. And so this is what has happened. Now. He says in verse 10, Therefore the sword shall never depart from your house, because you've despised me, and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, 
Behold, I will raise up adversity against you from your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor. He shall lie with your wives in the sight of this son, for you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel, before the son. You despised me, David. You despised the commandment of the Lord. Now, that word despised means to disdain. You disdained me. You despised me. How? You took my commandments lightly and you broke them. You ignored what I commanded because you just didn't care. There are a lot of people even to this day who do the same thing. They read the Bible or hear it preached to them. And, and there are things in that, that they're hearing uh, when it's being preached that they disagree with. And so what do they do? Instead of saying, I wonder if this is true. I wonder if God is really saying this. They just blow it off. They say, you got to be kidding. Listen, what's wrong with me taking out that girl? It doesn't matter whether she's married to that guy or not. She's already told me that, that she's not happily married. And I'm actually giving her a good time. I take her out to do things that her, her husband's not doing for her. What's wrong with that? Everybody deserves a little happiness in this lifetime. And as a Christian, I'm just giving to her joy. And God says, you despise my commandments. God says, you take them lightly. God says you don't, you're ignoring them. You don't, because they convict you, you just don't want any part of it. And therefore, you do what you want. You claim to, to love me, but in reality, you love the world and you love yourself so much that you won't even listen to me. And that's what Nathan is saying. You despised me. You rejected me. You disdained me. You disrespected me. You knew what the law said, and yet you did it anyway. David, you of all people are, are appointed to uphold that you are the king. You are the greatest example uh, outside of the priesthood of those who are supposed to be under the law. And so as a result of that, you're not getting away with it. There's going to be strife in your house. That's what he says in verse 11. I will raise up adversity against you from your own house. I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor. He shall lie with your wives in the sight of the sun. You did it secretly. I will do this thing before all Israel, before the sun. You did it in secret. This is going to be done openly. Strife will not leave your home. At one time, David's house probably had peace, the peace of the Lord, but now strife is going to be there because God's word has been ignored and dad has gone into sin. David's sons produced great sorrow for him. We'll see this. We'll see how his son Amnon actually raped his half-sister Tamar. We'll see how Absalom, the full brother of Tamar, took vengeance on Amnon by, have, by killing him. We'll see how Absalom tried to steal the hearts of the nation of Israel from his own father and tried to steal the nation. We're going to see what happened in their life. And that he ultimately, how, how Absalom ultimately actually openly slept with David's concubines on the roof of the house. So that Israel actually saw what took place. You'll see that in chapter 16. And so God says this, you did it secretly. I will do this thing before all Israel, before the sun. Well, verse 13, David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan said to David, the Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. However, because by this deed you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also who is born to you shall surely die. I have sinned against the Lord. Conviction. He doesn't say, incidentally, I have sinned against Uriah. He didn't say, I sinned against Bathsheba. Yes, he did. But he knows that the first and foremost individual that he sinned against was God himself. And he says that I have sinned against the Lord. You see, David is about to reap what he has sown. In Proverbs chapter 6, verses 32 and 33, it says, Whoever commits adultery with a woman lacks understanding. He who does so destroys his own soul. Wounds and dishonor he will get. And his reproach will never be wiped away. His reproach will never be wiped away. Every time you think of David as a believer, is it not true, if you're familiar with the Bible, is it not true that one of the first things that comes to mind will be, we'll say, David and Goliath, very famous story. But, but what movies have been made on David and Bathsheba? I mean, to this day, that's the thing that people think of with David. It's not simply David and Goliath, his greatest victory. It's David and Bathsheba, his greatest failure. His reproach has never been washed away. 
To this day, when people think of King David, they say that he was one who could have flown so much higher except for his failure before God with Uriah and Bathsheba. And his reproach has never been washed away. People will always remember David and Bathsheba, always. Many, many years ago now, I was invited with several others who were friends of a particular family to go to an engagement celebration. The young woman was, the daughter was engaged to be married and, and so being close to the family they had invited us to go, Marie and I and, and several others and, and, um, and there was a certain time during this, uh, this little get together where we were requested as married people to, to give some advice. Can you share a little bit about uh, what the Lord has taught you in marriage? And so we're all together, and it's a, it's a room full of people, and, and uh, uh, we were all sharing. You know, the Lord says this, the Lord says that, there's some laughter, there's some tears. You know, it's this family. And then this young woman's grandmother opens up, begins to share out of Scripture, and wants to share about the blessings of God in marriage and what to look for and what to avoid. And all of us in the room, at the same time, began just to look down. It wasn't on purpose. It wasn't intentional. It just was a reaction. I, I, I remember it very well. I was sitting there, and she opened the word, and she began to speak, and I just, I just looked down. And I watched, and I noticed the little girl, the granddaughter, as she kind of just nodded her head. And I'll tell you why. Because Grandma many, many years ago had left grandpa for grandpa's best friend. Married him. She was a professing Christian at the time. Married him after divorcing grandpa. And now she's opening the Bible and wanting to communicate how to have a good marriage. And it just was one of those things where everybody felt uncomfortable. No judgment wasn't being thrown on this woman. We didn't pick up any stones and stone her, drag her outside we're in the curb. It just was uncomfortable. After all of these years, the reproach has not left. It was an uncomfortable moment because everybody there knew that Grandma had not been faithful to Grandpa. I'm telling you, so many times people think, oh, it's okay, it's all covered. There is a repercussion. There will always be. And David has been going through some deep things, and now he says, I have sinned. Now his confession is sincere. He writes again in Psalm 32. Uh, I've already read verse 4, but let me read verses 4 and 5 where he says in Psalm 32, 4 and 5, Day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you. My iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. You forgave the iniquity of my sin. Or Psalm 51, verses 1 through 4, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin, for I acknowledge my transgressions. My sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. He goes on to say in verses 9 through 12, Hide your face from my sins. Blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation. Uphold me by your generous spirit. He sincerely repented. And as he sincerely repented, he, he says, my sin is always before me. It's something that haunts me day and night. It's something that when I go to bed at night, I think about. When I wake up in the morning, I can't help but think about it. It's always before me. God, forgive me a sinner. So the psalmist David says, this is what I went through, and I asked for forgiveness, and God forgave me. You know, the Bible makes it very clear. If I confess my sin, he is faithful and just to forgive me my sin and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. And so that's why Nathan says to him, your sin has been forgiven. But he goes on to say this in verse 14. However, because by this deed you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also who is born to you shall surely die. 
The enemies of the Lord are rejoicing. The enemies of the Lord are, are, are blaspheming God because of what you did, David, because, David, you are the king. Everybody knows that you slaughtered Goliath under the power of God. Everybody knows that. That is something that even the pagans in the surrounding nations know. That when you go out and when you were fighting with them, that you were having victory based on your relationship with God. All the pagans know that. And so these people have, have now an occasion to blaspheme God, David, because of what have you done. Not only that, but because not only the outside, but those even within the nation of Israel who are unbelievers. And seeing that the king of Israel, who is supposed to be under the law of God, has committed adultery and, and, and saw to it that, that, that Uriah, the husband, died. That has caused them to rejoice and to blaspheme God. Sometimes the world is just dying to see you fall because it gives them opportunity to say, what kind of God is that that you say you worship? He doesn't even give you the power to avoid getting drunk on Christmas. What kind of God is this? He doesn't even give you the ability to keep your vows that you made to your wife or your husband. And you're going to judge me? You know, I have friends who are in the world, atheists, who have better marriages than you, and you're always complaining about your marriage to me. And we give them occasion to blaspheme God all the time. You say you have a God of love, but you're the meanest person I've ever met in my life. You're cruel to everybody. You can't even be kind to your own children. And you're going to tell me about a God of love? Are you kidding me? And we give the, the people who don't know the Lord occasion, occasion to blaspheme. That's exactly what David did. He gave them occasion to blaspheme. And, and I tell you, and this is not coming from some paranoid pastor. I'm telling you the truth. People do watch you. Many, many years ago, prior to me becoming a pastor, I was working... At a, at a small warehouse and part of my duties was to unload trucks and, and uh, I was removing cartons from this, um, this uh, one of the trucks that had come in for uh, delivery and, and, and as I was removing the cartons I, I remember picking one of the cartons up and just placing it down reaching down and picking up another one turning around and beginning to walk and, and tripping over that carton now, my boss, my supervisor, knew I was a believer. I had told him. I had shared the Lord with him. I had told him about my, my walk with God and all, and, and I'd shared with him that he needs the Lord. And, you know, I tried to witness to him when given opportunity. And so as I turned and tripped over this box, um, you know, I, 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 I tripped and I stopped. And I remember putting my foot on it and sliding it out of my way. I just slid it out of the way so I could keep walking towards the pallet that I was loading up at. And, and it just so happens that my boss is walking by when he sees me kick that box. And the first thing he says to me is, oh, you're a Christian. You're not supposed to be losing your temper and kicking boxes around trucks. And I looked at him and I, I shot him. No, I, I, <laughs> no I, I looked at him and I smiled. And I'm just telling you, I mean, they, they watch you. And you know this, you know this. You put that little ichthus on your car and then you blow through this red light. There's going to be somebody who saw you do that. They'll let you know. And the little camera usually goes off and they'll let you know too. But that happens. You, you know, and it's true. You go to the family. It's Christmas. If you don't come off as a perfect Christian, there's somebody there who can say to you, Oh, I thought you were a believer. Isn't this Christmas? What's wrong with you? You don't even get along. That's how they do it. And we give people occasion to blaspheme. And that's what David did. And in David's case, as the king, the whole nation is aware that this king has done wrong and has gotten away with it. And Nathan says, the child's going to die. Severe sin, severe repercussion, David. So what does David do? Well, in verse 15, Nathan departed to his house, and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bore to David. She's referred to as Uriah's wife because she became pregnant when she was still married to Uriah. The Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bore to David, and it became ill. David therefore pleaded with God for the child. David fasted, went in, lay all night on the ground. The elders of his house arose, went into him to raise him up from the ground. He would not. 
nor did he eat food with them. There he is laying down crying, God, please spare the child. And, and the princes, the, the, the people there in his home would pick him up and try and lift him. And, and David would push him away. No, 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 I'm, I'm not going to eat. No, I'm going to stay before the Lord. And so they don't know what to do. It says in verse 18, the seventh day it came to pass that the child died. The servants of David were afraid to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, Indeed, while the child was alive, we spoke to him, and he would not heed our voice. How can we tell him that the child is dead? He may do some harm. When David saw that his servants were whispering, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore, David said to his servants, Is the child dead? They said, He's dead. So David arose from the ground, washed and anointed himself, and changed his clothes, and he went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he went to his own house, and when he requested, they set food before him, and he ate. Then his servant said to him, What is this that you have done? You fasted and wept for the child while he was alive. But when the child died, you arose and ate food. And he said, While the child was alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, Who can tell whether the Lord will be gracious to me, that the child may live? But now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. I thought that perhaps the Lord might show me some mercy, that he'd be gracious. And so I went before him, and I, I pleaded with him, and I begged. But the fact is, God has made a determination, and the determination was that the child would not live. There's nothing I could do about it. I did all that I can. That's why I can now worship, and that's why I can now eat. Now, one of the things that really speaks to me, and I want to point this out to you, is when he says in verse 23, Now he's dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. Comfort comes from the knowledge of where your loved one is. I've done a lot of funerals. The very first funeral I ever did, I was maybe 29 years old. And the very first funeral that I ever officiated was over a man who was an unrepentant sinner, absolutely unrepentant, alcoholic, addicted to gambling, child molester. His daughter, whom he had molested, had been in our fellowship I knew her well, and when her dad died, she and her brother came to me and asked if I would officiate over his funeral. All the people who showed up at that funeral were people like him. When I grew up, there was a phrase, a lady in red. The phrase lady in red was also a way of saying a lady of the night euphemisms for a prostitute. They called them ladies of the night or ladies in red at that time because many of them actually did wear red, bright red with bright red lipstick and all. And, and I have to tell you, this small chapel was filled with, with men exactly and women exactly like this man had been with all of his adult life. There were women who were fresh right off the street prostitutes who were there wearing red, bright red lipstick, bleached blonde hair. There were men that were almost stereotypes of gamblers and gangsters. You can't bring a lot of comfort when you give a message about a man who died and didn't know God. It's very hard. I'm not going to lie to these people. I'm not going to say, oh, so-and-so is in heaven now looking down because a man died without Christ. 
He died unsaved. He died in terrible sin. You can't lie to people. You can't go there giving them a false hope. You have to speak the truth. You have to. I was 29 years old, my first funeral. And as I'm looking at them, I said, this is so-and-so. His children's names are so-and-so and so-and-so. And the first thing I'd like to say is, shall not the judge of the whole earth do what is right? If he had an opportunity to speak to you today, I believe this is what he would say. Fear God, depart from evil. And I preach the gospel to these people. I said, he can't speak. He cannot come back to us. But if he was able to, he would say, accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. He would say that heaven is real and hell is real. And he would say that you want to avoid hell and go to heaven. And the way that you do this is through Jesus Christ. You cannot bring words of comfort when somebody has died. Even though you see it all the time on, on TV, some guy who is known for being uh, uh, just a notorious sinner, they all, his friends are always saying, oh, he's in heaven looking down. No, he's not. No, he's not. He's not. Why lie to the people? Tell them the truth. So the bottom line is, is David has comfort for a reason. He says, he will not come back to me, but I will go to him. We know that David is in one, verse 13 tells us, God has forgiven you of your sins. He's the one who said, God, take not from me your Holy Spirit. David went to heaven. So what David is simply saying is, I have comfort because I know where my child is. My child is in heaven, and I will go to be with him. He will not come back to me. And that gave him comfort, by the way. That's what comforts me. In my lifetime, as, as you, in yours, I've had those whom I've loved very deeply who have died. My father, father-in-law, others whom I've loved very deeply, who have died. Marie and I uh, actually have, you know of my four children, we actually have five children because she miscarried one of our babies. And what gives me comfort, though I have never seen that little baby face to face, I will see that baby in heaven. I will. And that was not just fetal tissue. That was not just a potential human life. That was my baby. And I will see my baby in heaven, you see. And David said, he will not come to me, but I will go to him. That gives you hope. In the New Testament, in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 7 and 8, Paul said it this way, we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yet as well pleased, rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. You see, joy is in heaven. I miss my dad. Sometimes I think of him pretty much every day. And sometimes I miss him terribly, but if I had the ability to say, Jesus, would you please bring my dad back? If my dad came back, he'd be mad. He'd be mad. Why did you bring me back here? I was beholding the face of God. I was enjoying the worship of heaven. There's no pain. There's no suffering. There's no sorrow. There's no disease. There's no death. There's only life. Why would I want to come back here? You see, that's what gives to us as Christians this great hope and comfort. Because yes, I have done a lot of funerals for unbelievers. With, with the, that's, their, their, their fate is sealed. They rejected Christ. So funerals are not for the dead, they're for the living. For those to hear the word, to get right with God, so that they might have a hope. And that's what David had. He won't come back to me, but I will go to him. We know that David is with the Lord and therefore he's giving us hope that one day we will too. Well, what happens? We'll close. Verse 24 and 25. David comforted Bathsheba, his wife, went into her, lay with her. She bore a son. He called his name Solomon. Now the Lord loved him 
And he sent word by the hand of Nathan the prophet. So he called his name Jedidiah because of the Lord. Solomon. There's discussion on what the name means, but most would say it means peaceful or peaceable. Jedidiah means beloved of the Lord. And what is being said here is that one day Jedidiah, Solomon, will ascend to the throne of Israel. God loves him. And you'll see something about that as we get to or get through Second Samuel. Let's pray.